Welcome everyone to the October 2022 uh, meeting of the Hadley Public Schools. May I have a motion to open this meeting? I'll move. Um, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we'll start with adjustments to the agenda. Annie, you want to take us through any of them? Yes, there will not be a report from CES, from Tara Brueger tonight uh, as the CES rep, but she's not with us this evening. We do have someone from CES to speak to um, the uh, item on the agenda, but Tara's report will wait until next month. Terrific, thank you. Um, okay, we're moving next to public comment. Um, as a reminder, uh, please keep your remarks to three minutes or under. Um, we won't go into discussion or acknowledge uh, necessarily um, comments that are made, but we will factor that into our thinking as we progress with this meeting. So if you'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will unmute your volume. Okay. Seeing none, we will move into the agenda. Excellent. So we begin this evening by recognizing three Hopkins Academy students. This is by far uh, probably my favorite school committee meeting of the year. There are so many phenomenal students to recognize. But tonight, we are going to be recognizing three exceptional young women from Hopkins Academy seniors. And I'm going to start by telling you about the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic Excellence. This is an award that is presented to a student who has distinguished him or herself in the pursuit of excellence during his or her high school career. I asked for recommendations from our faculty and the person that was nominated is Pema Zidik. Pema ranks first in her extremely competitive class. She has worked very hard to balance difficult courses with an extensive list of extracurricular activities and accomplishments. She's interested in studying international relations and has worked previously as a Tibetan classroom assistant, assisted instructors in teaching the Tibetan language and a volunteer English tutor with Ukrainian refugees. Pema is a member of our early college high school pathway she will graduate with 12 credits through this program from Greenfield Community College. She has taken additional courses as well and earned additional college credits. Congratulations, Pema, well done. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome, congratulations. We have two other folks to recognize this evening. The National School Development Council Award for Academic Growth and Student Leadership and Learning is presented to high school seniors who have consistently pursued a high level of academic effort and who have also served as positive role models for the student body. The recipients of the award also exemplify admirable character and accomplishment. We have two recipients this year, Taylor Berry. Taylor is a strong athlete, a leader, and an excellent student. She's an exceptional role model for younger peers. She's worked extremely hard over her high school career to challenge herself, and at the same time, making sure she took courses that interested her. She also is a member of our early college high school pathway, and she too will graduate with 12 credits from Greenfield Community College. Congratulations, Taylor. Well done. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And our third recipient is Brooke Roshan. Brooke excels academically and is also a pillar in the community. She's helpful, respectful, and another excellent role model for our younger peers. She is currently completing a teaching assistantship and working as a laboratory assistant with our forensic science and chemistry teacher. Brooke is responsible for accurately preparing labs and helping younger students with lab objectives. She too is a member of the Early College High School Pathway, and she will also graduate with 12 credits from Greenfield Community College. Brooke, congratulations. And so we could read and speak pages about every single one of you. 
I say this um, from the bottom of my heart. My job is better and wonderful because of the students just like all of you. I am so, so, so grateful to have the opportunity to lead a district where superstars like you all just shine. So thank you for everything you contribute and thank you for who you are. And we're really proud of you. Congratulations again to all the students and families. Uh, we are very proud of you. Unfortunately, Taylor's video wouldn't work. Oh, so she, is, she is trying to come in from home, but she does say thank you, as you heard. Congratulations. Congratulations. Terrific. All right. Thank you so much. We are going to move to the next item in the agenda. And uh, that is, let's see, uh, the approval of CES Capital Reserve Fund. And we have a guest here from CES, Dr. Gazda, the executive director. And let's make sure that um, Todd is able to unmute himself and speak. Yes, he is co-host. Todd, are you there? I am. Great, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the committee tonight. Um, in June, of this past year, June of 2020, the CES board voted to establish a capital reserve account. Um, now, Andy, was were you able to get the information sheet to the committee? Um, yes, they do. Okay. It's linked into the agenda. The committee and the public can see uh, the information for board members of motion language for school committee vote. Excellent, thank you. So I'll keep my um, comments concise. Uh, and I won't repeat everything on the, on the information sheet, but the information sheet was put together uh, for board members uh, to have conversations with their school committees uh, in order to explain kind of the background uh, for the creation of this account. So the creation of the account by the board is really the first step. According to our, by our collaborative agreement and the regulations, once the board votes to establish the account, it must be approved by two thirds of our member school districts. So we have 37 member districts at this uh, right, right now. Uh, and so that number is 25 uh, that need to approve the creation of this account. Now, the creation of this account involves no additional cost to Hadley or any other of our member districts. The purpose of this account is to allow us to plan in a thoughtful manner uh, for capital needs of the organization as we go forward. So in the document, I've outlined some of the needs um, that this account can be used for. In 2021, in the fall of 2021, we began a process and we hired an outside consultant to do a full analysis of both the buildings we own. We own the building at 97 Holly Street and we own the building over on Pleasant Street where Heck Academy is. So both of those buildings are owned by the collaborative. Um, so the company came through and they went through and we found in general that our buildings were in decent shape. Uh, however, uh, for the past 30 or so years, we haven't done a lot of upkeep, maintenance, um, modernizing. And so uh, the purpose for this account is to really take care of needs going forward as well as ensure that our buildings are brought up uh, to you know, current expectations for programs uh, where we have both kids in and for office space where um, our central office staff work. Um, so in looking at this, things that we need to have done in our buildings, uh, HVAC work, uh, we did do the necessary work to kind of get it where it needed to be for the pandemic, but it was kind of patchwork. At this point, what we really need to do is uh, renew and revitalize our HVAC systems, both in uh, 97 Holly Street and Heck Academy, with an eye towards environmentally mentally conscious um, alternatives as well. Uh, so we're going to explore those options. Um, but that's just one example. The other thing is we're moving forward with renovations at 97 Holly Street. 
hasn't been painted in years. The carpet, if anybody has been in that building anytime recently, is a really strange brown color. Um, and so, you know, trying to make it an inviting workspace for our employees. It must have been, so just as, uh, as many of you are probably aware, um, I began at uh, CES a little over a year ago now. And one of the, well, it must have been about right around this time last year, I began the process of trying to get us back to normal and try to get everybody back into the office. Um, and it should really come as no surprise that I, I experienced some resistance uh, to making, to having that occur. And so one of the things I looked at and one of the begin things we began to analyze is, you know, why? Why are we trying to force everybody back into the office? In looking at the services we'd provided to our member districts over the past two, year, two plus years of the pandemic, um, especially those divisions uh, that, you know, worked out in the field such as 21st century. Uh, a lot of our professional development, our, our consultants and the people who do trainings in the field, uh, early childhood, um, and then uh, things like math migrant and our special educators in special education surrogate program. These have been really working remotely for two years, providing even better services for our constituents and saving money. And so one of the things we did was, rather than try to force everybody back to work and back into the office, we decided to kind of go the opposite way and leaned into creating a hybrid model of operating. Uh, benefits to that are uh, examples, you know, it helps for recruitment and retention of employees. We can expand our uh, candidate pool uh, to both help increase the quality of candidates in the pool uh, and the diversity of candidates in the pool. So that was one element. The other thing is it allowed us to uh, drop some lease space. We were leasing space at 123 Holly Street for about $60,000 a year. Who was in that space? Early childhood, uh, 21st century. And early childhood, 21st century. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the third group. 21st century and... Uh, it's not coming to me right now. Uh, but we, rather than force them back in, we let go of those leases at the end of the year when they expired. And we supported those uh, employees in working fully remote from home for those divisions. Now, some there are some positions where that's just not possible. The teachers in our SEIS and DYS contracts, they have to be in, in classrooms teaching kids. People who were running trainings in districts, they have to be in, you know, in the districts running trainings. People who do face-to-face -face, uh, work for CES uh, for trainings have to be where that training is occurring. So you know, those type of uh, services still have to be face-to-face -face, and we recognize that, but we took a look to see where could we build some flexibility. Uh, we established a group to look at this and really kind of explore this hybrid model of doing business. And we're in the process of kind of creating that. This capital plan supports that transition, increasing technology in our conference room downstairs so that we can offer robust hybrid uh, professional development where people can be present in person and face to face and have a similar experience. Uh, for that professional development. Uh, we're looking to really take a look at Heck Academy and redesign the space inside that building to serve the needs of today's educational environment and today's students. Uh, look at right now, if, in, if you've been in there recently, um, it's kind of a strange configuration. And as over the years, walls were put up, offices created, you know, a redesign of that space is necessary uh, to really take a look uh, at how we can reshape that, uh, to be able to add uh, additional programming, an additional space for additional programming, as well as meet the needs of the, the students in that program now. So all this is kind of wrapped up into the decision-making process, but we want to be able to approach this in a thoughtful manner. Um, and so that's why we're coming to you today. Uh, and that's why we went to the board in June to propose a capital reserve account uh, to allow us to plan uh, financially uh, for these changes that we're making. Initially, 
the the influx of dollars uh, into the capital reserve account will be from the forgiveness of a payroll protection loan that CES got uh, during the pandemic. That um, that loan allowed us to continue operations, kept staff employed, and kind of filled the revenue gap uh, that uh, a lot of places experienced at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, unlike school districts that, and this was, this was a big change for me, transitioning from a superintendent to essentially running a business, was the fact that we don't get all our money up front. Um, as a superintendent, I got $32 million a year um, from the town and state to operate my schools. And so you draw down on that money over the course of the year and you kind of knew, you know, as you were getting towards the end of the year that, you know, money was running, you're getting tight. For us, we have to earn, we, we take our best estimates at what revenues are gonna be, what expenses are going to be. Uh, and then we have to, over the course of the year, make sure that those revenues come in. Uh, unlike school systems, we don't, don't have access to MSBA funds. We don't have access to any of the HVAC money uh, that the state uh, has made available for schools. Um, we don't get Chapter 70 money. All our money comes in from tuitions, revenues, contracts, and grants. So it's you know essentially business that we generate. <clears throat> so this uh, the pay the forgiveness of that payroll protection. A loan allowed us to pay off the mortgages in both 97 Holly Street and the Pleasant Street building. So we own those buildings free and clear now. So now we have to set those buildings up to serve uh, the needs of the organization and our member districts for the next 50 years. So that's why I'm coming here tonight. Very good. Thank you, Todd. Um, my, I, um, I'm going to open it up to questions from uh, the committee members before we take a vote on the uh, article. Uh, as a reminder that viewing public, uh, the board of CES is comprised of one school committee member from every school district that is a member. And so some things require full, a fuller vote than just the folks who show up to your board meeting. And this is one of those things. The question that I had was around the Payroll Protection Act, as I understood, it was very clearly uh, designated for just a few things, um, payroll, uh, rent, uh, lease uh, related to building. Um, there, there may be one other thing, but it's really narrow. And um, so I had questions about how that could uh, result in additional revenue, um, but I think, what you explained was that the revenue from your fee-based activities and your grants did come in in time. And because you used it initially for payroll, it qualified as uh, no strings attached money that you could then keep. Is, is that an accurate way to summarize? That, that is accurate. So it basically, you know, when the pandemic hit, everything kind of shut down. You, you know, remember, you know, March to June of 2020, we just simply shut down. Um, so when we shut down, we don't have revenues coming in. Uh, now, we, so we were able to utilize the payroll protection money uh, through that period and others and, you know, in, into the fall to keep people employed, to keep them working. Um, we did some things uh, during that time uh, to really help support districts. We put together a paraprofessional training um, for, uh, for, dist for paras in districts that they could tap into because districts were looking for ways to give them um, something to do uh, while students were fully remote. Uh, and so we put something together for that. Uh, we continued trainings. Uh, we did a work uh, through Casey Daigle with, Date, with Google and some other things to help support districts. But you're right, that filled the gap. And then as revenues came in, we set that revenue aside to be able to pay back that loan. Uh, and then when um, the federal government forgave that loan, and by the way, we had to document all of this, and then we had to submit that documentation as part of the forgiveness for that loan. Um, and so we, we had to document all of that extensively. Uh, and then when that was forgiven, the funds we had set aside were then freed up, uh, and we were, able to, we were able to utilize them in this manner. Uh, and they count essentially as revenue uh, for FY22. Very good, thank you. Other questions from committee members? 
Hey, Tan, this is Paul Pfeiffer. So you said that the PPP helped you uh, pay off the building, so now they're owned free and clear. But then you said this reserve fund would be at no cost to us. Help me understand the math. So how are you so, going to populate the reserve fund? So the money from uh, that, so in other words, it's, we're not going to increase fees in order to put more money in this reserve fund. Uh, the cap on the reserve fund is about $5 million. Initially, we don't anticipate putting that much money in there. Um, quite frankly, our fund balance uh, that we have, which think of it as uh, the collaborative saving account, has been really low for years, uh, which means our cash on hand has been really low. Uh, and so we've had to even you know, uh, tap into lines of credit at times to pay employees until um, our revenues caught up with the services uh, we've been providing. There's always a slight delay. Uh, because we bill for services, and so we got to do the services, got to pay the people, but then we have to get the res revenue in. So sometimes there's a delay. We have been operating uh, with a fund balance that's really low, and quite frankly, has made Desi a little nervous. And so uh, we want to bring that up uh, to you know toward to more towards uh, typically where it is, which is around 20, 25 percent is what you're of operating budget, which is what you're allowed to have in there. Um, and so we anticipate probably putting in to, I'm thinking somewhere between two, maybe a little over 2 million into the capital reserve account uh, initially. Uh, the reason that the cap is 5 million is because we're beginning to explore the potential of a, some type of um, a capital campaign fundraising um, in order to generate more funds and, you know, through philanthropic donations and other, other ways. Um, so we wanted to have a little space in there so that we didn't have to keep coming back to increase the cap space. Um, so we put what we felt was a reasonable amount of space in there in case there is a relatively large donation. It's important to note, no money can go into or out of that capital reserve account without approval of the board of directors. Um, so it's not like something I can just, you know, pull uh, money from here and there. It has to be approved by the board of directors in order for money to come into and out of that account. So we're not looking to raise tuitions in order to cover the cost uh, or to put more excess money into that account. Your, tu tu your fees right now are about $3.50 per student is what you pay to the collaborative. Um, we're not looking to increase that so that we can put more money into our capital reserve account. So that's kind of what I meant by not, um, there's no cost to the districts. Um, we're not looking to increase the rates or fees in order to fill that up to take care of our capital projects. Without the uh, payroll protection loan money, this is what, it's things like that we would have to begin to explore. Um, and so this gives us kind of a freedom from that. And it's, it, it really is, um, kind of a one-time chance for the organization to really position itself uh, for the years going forward. Any other questions for Todd? Uh, hey guys, I, I just, I guess I'm just looking for clarity. Uh, Todd, thank you for that presentation. We're, so we're, we, our responsibility is to uh, approve this so that the collaborative can move forward with the fund. Is that, is that where we're at? 100%. Perfect. It's Thank already you. it was approved unanimously by the board uh, in June. Perfect. And so tonight we would be voting to um, uh, approve a motion. I can read it out loud from the uh, information uh, document that you shared with us, Todd, you and your staff, uh, to approve the creation of the Collaborative for Educational Services Capital Reserve Account with a balance limit of $5 million for the purpose of accumulating funds for the acquisition, maintenance, and improvement of capital items. That is the motion. Do I hear a support for that motion? So moved. That's seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Was that an aye? aye. Yeah, aye. Okay. All right, terrific. All right, motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you so much, Todd. Uh,
it was great to hear from you and um, and to meet you for the first time. Your predecessor came and presented a little bit about CES in general. And um, while this presentation was not dedicated to that, I welcome you back to do that uh, sometime in the future. And I will take an opportunity to share with Annie. Um, we put together a promotional brochure because sometimes um, it's hard to kind of grasp. The, the organization is really big and has, offers a lot of, has a lot of diverse offerings. Um, I myself was kind of surprised when I came, th came in. I thought I knew what CES did. Uh, and then it turns out I only, it was like, I could only see the elephant's trunk. Uh, and so I'm going to share it with you. It's a very nice brochure that articulates, um, you know, kind of the benefits uh, for member districts belonging to the collaborative. But I appreciate the committee's time today, and I really appreciate your support. This is an exciting time for CES uh, as we look to posi position ourselves going forward. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, um, we are going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, presentations of school and program strategy documents with goals. Um, and it's the entire leadership team who will present. We're gonna start with uh, Hopkins Academy, um, April Camuso. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone coming out tonight to hear our updates. I am going to highlight just a couple of items that are new to the document, if otherwise the same strategy document as last year. But of course, if you have any questions about anything that's not new as well, feel free to ask about anything that's on here. So there are three items that I wanted to go over. The first one is from the first column under standard A instructional leadership. And that one has to do with something that we actually started last year, but failed to include in this document. And it's really important to our goals around inclusivity and equity and it's work that we are continuing. So I wanted to highlight it. And that is developing a more inclusive program for our special education students in middle school. So this includes using co-teaching in our math and English classes for our students that would have previously been in pullout classes. And that has been going very, very well. I'm very happy with it. And Ms. Mulligata, um, who was our new special education teacher last year has done a great job working with all of the teachers around this. So we're excited to continue that work and we are working on getting feedback and professional development for teachers in order to have effective co-teaching models in the school. It was already, um, we don't have co-teaching in the high school but we didn't have the separate classes in the high school. So it's a bigger change for our middle school setup. The other one I wanted to address is from the second column. So the second standard there, management and operations, that really could kind of be in a couple of different places. And this is the idea of using social network analysis in order to try and identify that every student um, and staff member really each has somebody in the district that they trust in some way and can go to for a variety of things. So that's something that we'll be working on this year and uh, finding out that information through surveys and then mapping that using social network analysis in order to identify if there are any students or staff who do not have enough connections and connections of various kinds. And the third item I want to look at is in the fourth column, which is under the professional culture standard. And that is a big change this year. It's also a, a management and operations change because it affects our schedule and our busing, but really the heart of it has to do with the staff collaboration. Our staff have now had two of their, for us, delayed start days where they get to collaborate with one another. Staff members all selected other staff members to work with on a variety of different topics. So one group, for example, is working to differentiate. I have a combination of a, a gen ed teacher, an ESP, um, I think there's actually two ESPs in that group, and a special education teacher who are working together to differentiate the curriculum for some students in that classroom. So that is another piece that we're continuing this year and I'm hoping everyone's going to love and we're gonna be able to continue to add moving forward. Because as you know, staff collaboration is something that's really near and dear to my heart and research shows has a very large positive impact on student achievement. So those are the, the three ones that I wanted to highlight, but of course, any questions, comments, concerns, I'm happy to, to hear feedback on anything or answer questions. Those are three great ones, April. Some of these items like co-teaching and um, 
uh, professional learning groups are things that are, you know, some cutting edge universities are doing in, in my community and network. So it's really nice to see this happen at our very own high school. Uh, thank you. I, I look forward to digging into uh, to some of the action plans as well that you linked in here. Um, thank you for doing that. Opening it up to feedback from the others. Uh, the other school committee members and, and Jen, Jen has her hand raised. So I'm gonna call on Principal Dowd. Um, I think she can't make herself visible when she needs to or heard. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Jen, did you have a question? No, I didn't. I was just uh, really fearful that I was gonna be locked out of the meeting. Oh, um, so <laughs> yeah, we made you co-host. You're good, you're here, Thank you're you. on deck next. Thank you so Great much. Great job, Principal Camuso, She's while I'm She's just too at. excited. She wants to get I, in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, to my other school committee colleagues, Ethan, Paul, Christine, any comments on the Hopkins Academy presentation? Oh, looks good to me. Thanks, April. Okay, terrific. Thank you, April. We're gonna move next to Hadley Elementary School with Principal Dowd. Take it away, Ms. Dowd. Thank you, thank you very much. And thanks for letting me into the meeting. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, first, I just wanna say thank you so much for letting me present tonight on my strategic document. Um, each year has felt uh, a little different and I have to report that this year feels like the opening of school has run very smoothly. Um, and so I'm just happy to report that I am here and the building, we had a great opening of school. And so I'm happy to report and just give some highlights of the document that you all received. Um, the first just being in section A, instructional leadership. Last year, we finally selected our new ELA program, and we were fortunate enough to purchase the entire um, curriculum, which is our Wonders curriculum. And so this year, staff will be working together and using collaboration time to implement that program in kindergarten to grade six. The teachers have already started their work um, in the first couple of professional development days, so that will be ongoing. We also started this last year, um, just to highlight, um, we strengthened our teacher input through the HES leadership team. This was a team that naturally developed um, during COVID to answer questions. It was just so much information for just a building principal to manage. And so we had some stakeholders come together um, to build and strengthen our problem solving skills and our communication. And so that's a, a small team, a leadership team that has continued. And I'm really excited that we're continuing that work. At Hopkins, they have department chairs and other natural groups of, of folks to problem solve, but in HES, um, we really did it. And so I'm excited that we've strengthened the communication and allowing teachers to give feedback and bring problems to the HES leadership team so we can collaborate together. The second, um, in the second uh, item is management mm -hmm. operations. This is continued work around creating an effective learning environment. Additions to this plan include increased staff collaboration time, which Principal Camuso spoke about, increasing um, and allowing staff to meet and discuss how to best support students. Also, the addition of added collaboration goals with Principal Camuso around our, transition, our transitions and for our students who are gonna be transitioning. So our, think of our sixth graders going into seventh grade. Um, so really, how can we make sure that we're including students and thinking about their next steps? And it sounds like there's a lot of great things happening at Hopkins um, to get excited about. The third is family and community engagement. This highlights, um, inclu the highlights include continuing to invite our HES families in and provide enriching events in which we can be together as a community. We've already experienced some this school year in our traditional open house event. And this week we have our parent conferences, which it seems almost every single parent has signed up for. So we will be doing that this week, inviting families in to talk about their children. And so that's exciting. Other events besides our open house are PTO events. Um, World Fair is gonna be back this year. So we're excited about that. We're gonna be planning that. Um, literacy events, field trips. I've already gotten so many requests for field trips. So we're gonna be doing 
uh, events like that. We will be doing a springtime ice cream social event, which I think will be wonderful to bring in prospective families and also just enjoy a warmer, warmer weather and the summer coming. So we'll be planning that throughout the school year. Some opportunities that we have also included this year is a continuation of our Spanish lab. PTO is purchasing free shirts for all students, which is wonderful. So every child will be included in our spirit wear. We also started chorus during school hours. So this is new. So whether or not you have transportation or somebody to pick you up and drop you off, you can still participate in chorus. And I think that's just wonderful with opening up equal access to all students who are eligible for that. We also am starting a diversity club this year. So I'm excited about that. Uh, permission slips will be going out soon. Um, and we also are doing, um, we just started a homework club. We started about two weeks ago. So this is before school care for, for students um, in grades two through six. Families can drop their students off. They're supervised with well, I have two adults right now helping students do their homework. So if parents are having a hard time doing homework with their kids, they can drop them off before school and somebody else will have to deal with them. <laughs> so it's worked out pretty nicely so far. Another nice thing that I've seen is some families that have to drop off our school choice families who have to drop off students at Hopkins and then wait around for an hour um, to then drop at the elementary school. It's just provided a nice opportunity for families to be able to get to work a little bit earlier and know that their children are safe and cared for. And finally, our professional culture. Um, I continue to maintain our commitment to a professional and kind school culture. Uh, I've added specific examples of some things that I've done over the past couple of years, which is maintaining an open door policy, um, schedule regular staff meetings. Also with new staff, this has been very helpful this year. We have some friendly, wonderful new teachers that are excited to start at Hadley Elementary School. And so just meeting with them on a weekly basis to problem solve, answer any questions and make them feel comfortable has just been lovely. So I'm, I will continue to do that. I am going to, again, build our HES leadership team, which is small now, but we will be branching out and inviting other stakeholders to the meetings and supporting staff and allowing for more collaboration time. So those are just some highlights of some things that we've been working on. I'm open for any questions, comments, feedback. This is terrific. Jen, thank you so much. I'm especially excited to hear that you're going to continue Spanish at the elementary school for a second year. I know that was very well received and I'd love to um, see that program grow. Um, I'm also uh, really pleased to hear about the diversity club. And uh, so can't, can't wait to find out more about that. Um, I'm gonna open it up to comments from my colleagues. Hey, Jen. Sorry. Go ahead, Chris, go ahead, Chris. Oh, go ahead. I just, when you were talking about the before school homework help, is that is that every day? It's every day, Monday through Friday. Um, we have students, homework usually starts really easy in second grade with some reading and, mm -hmm. and some light work. Um, but we open up grades two through six and Monday through Friday. So somebody is always there at the start of school. The kids come in, they meet in the cafeteria. There's two staff members there who are working with students to help support them academically. It's open to anybody who needs it. And so we just started that about two weeks ago. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to provide that for families. That's great. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, that's what I was gonna, I was gonna ask about that too. So that begs the question, is that sort of, not just from a homework perspective, but the pre, how should I say, before school care, drop off care, is that an unmet need? That I actually hadn't even thought about it before. Well, I, I, it's a great question. And I think this lends nicely to at least seeing how many kids are gonna be accessing it. It's at no cost to families. So if families need to get their children there, um, if I was a betting person, I would, I would say that there's absolutely a need probably in kindergarten and grade one with the youngest students, um, just looking at how many students access the after school program. Um, but this is a nice first step into exploring the possibilities for before school care. 
how how do you plan on managing the numbers in terms of staff to student? Is there a limit that can access this, or I, I'm just wondering if you if you all of a sudden become overwhelmed with students and then it becomes you know where students aren't really focusing on homework so much as this is uh just pre like before school care yeah it was one of the um one of the things that kept me up in the middle of the night to be honest before it started um i had a terrible nightmare that every single student you know of grade two to grade six showed up on the first day of homework club and i, I only imagine. had yeah, and I only had two teachers. Right now, it's it's pretty steady. Um, so it's about between five and ten kids. Um, mm-hmm. Again, it just started, so we're we're really going to monitor to see how many kids are accessing it. And then, you know, Dr. McKenzie's been really great about taking any feedback or, you know, being there to support us if we if we might need additional staff. But right now, mm-hmm. we're we're in pretty good shape. Um, if more students decided to access it. To me, that's wonderful. Um, and if we can plan things around COVID-19, we can plan homework club. So uh, oh, sure. we, would, we would do breakout spaces. We would access the library. We'd find alternative classrooms. Um, right now, it doesn't seem like that's a need, but it could change at any moment. So we just need to communicate and, and, and plan if things shift. Mm-hmm. No, I think it's great. Ethan, any comments or questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Principal Dowd. Appreciate it. This is a terrific uh, plan for what promises to be a great year. Thank you. Thank you again. Great questions. All right, moving on to the next item of our agenda, we have student services program goals and priorities. And Annie, who is it's Celia Snow? It doesn't look like, and I cannot see. I, I, yep, I got you. Okay. Welcome, Celia. Okay, there it is. <laughs> uh, hold on one sec. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Well, um, Thank you for letting me come and present. It's been quite a while since I've had the opportunity to speak at a school committee meeting. So um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, So as I, in past, um, my focus as the student services department is to really uh, look at how I can support and collaborate what's going on in the general ed curriculum and make sure that students with disabilities are also included. Um, So this past year, I've been really focusing on what is the specialized instruction Um, But also more importantly, how does it align with or supplement what's going on in the general ed classrooms? Um, So in looking at sort of uh, the develop and continuously revised curriculum to ensure rigor, relevance and alignment to state standards, something that we did this year is um, we purchased the entire uh, curriculum, the new reading curriculum, we purchased the intervention uh, curriculum to go alongside the wonders curriculum that they're doing at the elementary school. Um, so that's the wonder works intervention. And we purchased that for each of the special education teachers, which I'm not sure if that's been done before. Um, but um, that was a big endeavor. And so uh, likewise, with the collaboration time, um, now the special ed teachers will be able to collaborate with the general ed teachers. And, you know, they have they have the same curriculum, just the intervention materials. Uh, so I think that's a really great step in um, aligning what's happening in special ed and what's happening in the general ed curriculum. Um, I'm hoping that you know, in the future, we'll be able to do that with the math curriculum as well, but I don't think that um, HES is quite set on its math curriculum, so uh, we're not doing that quite yet. Um, And then another thing, and if we're looking at the secondary and aligning the curriculum, um, we have the new co-teaching model, Uh, so that's where we're really focusing on the inclusion model. Last year, um, I offered a full day uh, professional development to Ms. Koki and some of her other co-teachers with Lisa Deeker. And then now we are looking at doing like a three-year phased um, academy, MTSS Academy, uh, that will focus on universal design that Ms. Koki is gonna be participating in as well. Uh, So those are some things that we're putting in place to help expand that co-teaching model in terms of um, our more specialized programs. So 
co-teaching is in its second year, and then our life skills program is also in its second year. Um, and we have expanded that this year to include middle school students. So last year it was only high school, and this year we've now expanded it to middle school. Um, I've purchased two curriculums. So I started with N2Y, uh, which is a it gives curriculum that aligns to state standards. And we had um, ELA, math, science, and social studies. Um, we recently added a new curriculum called Teach Town, which also aligns to the state standards. Um, it's a little more comprehensive. I felt it aligned better. And then it also includes the life skills curriculum as part of it. So that's really important. Um, so that way, you know, the students either having their curriculum when they're in the life skills program or they're able to be in the general classrooms for the core content and have a curriculum that's aligned that can also be integrated into the new maps uh, that um, April has been working on getting everybody working on for the di different curriculums. Um, in terms of, uh, well, the implementation of the MTSS, I will be participating in the consultation with Dr. Marcotte uh, so that we can have better alignment again between all the tiers of instruction, um, including special ed, which special ed in the past has not participated in those um, consultative ses sessions. So that's gonna be a new thing as well. Um, also with the professional culture that Ms. Dowd mentioned, um, I've been participating in the HES leadership team meetings as well. Uh, so those are all things that are going on to help the special ed department and student services department align better with um, what's going on in the general ed classrooms and what's going on in each building as well. Thank questions. you. No. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Um, questions for Ms. Snow on um, the student services department. Okay, and I would just like to say, I'm thankful that the police didn't rush in on my presentation because I am still at the elementary school building. <laughs> so I will be exiting the building shortly. Okay, very well. Thanks, Thanks Celia. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, moving on to the next item of the agenda, we are discussing the SEL MTSS coach goals and priorities for 2022 and 2023. And for that, we'll hear from Michelle Utoitz. Hi everyone, thanks for having me again this month. Um, I know I just presented last month and this doc kind of captures a lot of that. So I don't wanna to be too, too repetitive for you. I do wanna highlight a couple of things overall, the doc um, better captures, it includes the language of the multi-tiered systems of support. You'll see that reflected in both the vision statement and in the uh, standards one and two language there. Um, a couple of highlights or expansions on last month's is that uh, the professional development that I'll facilitate this year, last year it was focused on uh, HES, this year it's more heavily focused at Hopkins Academy. Um, last month, I talked a bit about uh, how we developed and researched and looked for data systems to use and our screenings. Uh, as you heard last month, we rolled those out. We completed all of our fall screenings in both literacy, math, and mental health for all of our K through 12 students. And um, as mentioned last month, revamping our previously uh, what was known as our child study process to tiered support team um, process. Those meetings have begun now that we've had six weeks under our belts, uh, things are going smoothly. And the other piece that I wanted to highlight is um, since the start of school, we have uh, found out we've received two additional grants, um, both which will support all of, all of this work. So um, not only SEL, but our systems of support in social emotional learning, as well as literacy and math. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the document. Congratulations on securing the additional funding. Sounds like your, uh, your position is really breaking even and uh, that's really positive news. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Paul, Ethan, Christine, questions for Michelle? No, I just wonder, Annie, 
I mean, all we see are the awards that uh, and grants you all are successful for. So I just assume you're betting a thousand, you and your team on me. So no, you I can to, speak you when I need to disprove me of that, that. No, when I talk about the district one that you have to vote on, I can tell you the ones we're still waiting on. But pretty close to all the ones we're either waiting or pretty close. That's great. Yeah, and that's all, Annie. I can't take credit for that. I'm, <laughs> I'm just doing some of the work beyond it once we get it. <laughs> okay. Michelle, can you just remind me how long have you been in this term? Is it two years now? Is it more than two years? This is the second year, yeah. Second year, yeah, okay. You completed one full year. Yes. That's correct. Yes, yes. Excellent. And when does this term, it, this, it, they run congruent with the school year? That's correct. Yeah, okay, thanks. Terrific. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, and the one that you have to vote on, which is the district and the overarching goals, because we put together a five-year plan and the school committee participated in that. So the overarching goals don't really change. It's just every year I call out the activities that we're focused on for that particular year. And a lot of these, so a big one is securing funding to expand and enhance commitments we've made and investments we've already made. To date, we've submitted uh, about a quarter of a million dollars in grants as of October 30th, we had, October 30th, as of September 30th, we had submitted about a quarter of a million dollars in uh, competitive grant funds. That doesn't include our entitlement grants. And we have been successful in receiving the social emotional learning and mental health continuation grant. We did get the very competitive safe and supportive schools action planning grant and integrating social emotional and academic learning grant. We were accepted into the inclusive instruction through Universal Design for Learning Academy and Ms. Koki will be the lead teacher involved in that efforts. So we're very excited about that. We also received a competitive lead for literacy. This, this grant will support the work that uh, Jen talked about, Ms. Dowd talked about in terms of the integration of the Wonders curriculum and making sure that our literacy tiered systems of support are well documented and aligned with evidence-based practices. We also received a very competitive grant from the executive uh, branch of Massachusetts government. They're called STEM-focused internships. I've had this in my newsletter now for the past couple of weeks. We have a total of $45,000 available. And um, there is enough money in that grant to pay for 25 paid internships. I'm extremely grateful to departments in town. Hadley Media has written up and identified two student internships. I highlighted those in the form I sent out to students. Really exciting opportunities. Uh, Hadley Fire has also has internships. The Conservation Committee has sent us an internship. Um, so this is exciting and I do appreciate all of the people, uh, Keegan and Curran across the street has taken on a student intern. I appreciate the businesses, the town departments who are supporting this experiential and out of school time learning, which is so valuable to our students and our students really enjoy it. I'd like to put a plug out here and I'll be sending out a letter to parents. If you have any connections in industries where we may uh, be able to place students, particularly in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and healthcare, uh, please reach out directly to me. Even if you just want to suggest to me, you might want to contact this person. Uh, if, if a member of the community would like to facilitate an introduction, I'm very open to that. Or if you just want to give me an idea and say, well, Annie, I, I'm not comfortable with you saying that I sent you there, but you may want to look over here. Whatever people want to suggest, I'm open to it because our students are really enjoying this. Um, we are, we also received an additional early college support grant. We're waiting to hear on a couple other uh, innovation pathways support grants. And there's a request for proposal that is out today. Uh, I have to look for it. It is out today. So I'll look for it tomorrow for a, an opportunity where students would have both, it's kind of blending early college high schools. So you can earn tuition free college credit and the elements of innovation pathways, so experiential career immersion experiences and internships in the tech sector. So we'll be applying for that so we can have a tech pathway for students. Um, so a lot of the work to date this year and will continue to be work that supports making sure that we create the conditions for deep learning. So that means learning that is relational 
where students or adults are establishing positive relationships with one another, student to student positive relationships, learning that is experiential, that extends beyond the school day, that is relevant and that is personalized, matched to the interests and, uh, and interests of students. We also are investing in a lot of these grants in those tiered systems of support. So the big overarching goal in our district is that we meet every student, staff, and family member exactly where they're at. And we honor everything that they bring and we walk with them through their challenges and we allocate resources in a way to support them through challenges. We encounter them, we see you wherever you are, we honor and respect where you are, and we invest in getting you to where you wanna go next. So we encounter, affirm, and encourage your development. And the activities this year are really focused on that. Uh, we look forward to in February having a, the preliminary view of an equity dashboard. We wanna make sure as we undertake these uh, steps to meet everyone where they're at, that we're doing that with a focus on equity and make sure that nobody is left behind. Um, and uh, always focused on having mutually supportive and mutually supportive relationships with the community and with our families. We appreciate the support they give us and we are always looking for ways in which we can support them. Some of these grants also help us to do that. So the activities, the priorities for this year are listed. I probably am overly ambitious, but um, I do that every year and you folks are forgiving. I, I shoot I shoot to the moon and then I land in Lake Chicago, but my heart's in it the whole way. So that's that's for this year and you would need to approve because these are the these are the activities and goals that you'll evaluate me on throughout the course of the year. Thank you, Annie. Um, I, I would definitely say you shoot for the moon and land in the stars, definitely. Uh, we, we, this is, uh, uh, an incredible track record of identifying grants that are consistent with our priorities and uh, securing them. Um, I'm especially uh, excited to hear about the internships. I think they do um, help us achieve our goals around deeper learning. Um, and uh, I have uh, some contacts, may, they may be dated, but in the 2000s, I ran a technology association in our region, so I might be able to help connect. Uh, so definitely call on me if you um, are, are interested in that. Um, I have no other questions about this. It's consistent and, and definitely you can see where some of the other presentations we've hear, heard before flow into this really nicely. So thank you for um, creating um, that alignment. Um, colleagues, uh, any comments on this or questions for Annie? My only question, Annie, on the internships, do they have to be local? No. So the challenge is we do want to keep in mind equity and support and other things. They don't have to be. However, if they're not, and these are out of school time and um, some, some can be done during the school day, but also because of the high school schedule that we're working on, uh, a lot of this happens out of school. They don't have to be local. Um, but we also, we want to blend because not all students, because then transportation can become a bit of a challenge. But I would ask people if they have an idea, if they have a thought, um, if it's virtual, if it's not local, if it's any idea, please reach out to me and I will be sending out a letter to parents and um, to the larger community uh, to please reach out because the students really love it. And it's something that we're committed to. And one of the ways we really want to distinguish Hopkins Academy, I mean, there are many ways to distinguish it. But this investment in early college, high school, innovation pathways, and meaningful out-of-school time learning where students can really check out careers and pursue their interests is we just want to double down on that effort. So any ideas, please, people, email me. Because for now, until I get another grant, I'll be trying to coordinate and organize this, but I'm working on a grant to get someone to do that right now. This was uh, after his high school year, but my eldest did a, a remote internship for uh, involving technology and research and developing a, a database uh, for a, 
his customers in California. So it it sounds to me like that could be even Absolutely. a much yes. better equitable uh, way to access really cool Absolutely. jobs. Okay, Absolutely. terrific. Yes. All right, thank you. And so this requires a vote. And so do I hear a motion to approve uh, the Hadley Public School Strategy Document 2019-2024? So moved. Make a motion. Seconded. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you, Annie. We are moving next to uh, the results of the 2022 MCAS accountability presentation. Yes, so pretty brief, just a couple of slides that are linked into the agenda. It's easier than trying to share screens. Anyone in the public can just click on it right in the agenda. You can see it. Um, so we did what the, the first bit of data that I provided for you are the percent of students in each grade level in English language arts who are meeting or exceeding expectations. These would be the most recent results are from spring of 2022. You see their results for Hadley Public Schools for 2019 compared to the state. Then in 2021, we did not administer MCAS in 2020. We closed down in the spring. So 2021 and again in 2022. And any areas that shaded green, Hadley Public Schools um, performed as well as or exceeded the state. And you can see in 2022, where across the state, um, there were some, some performance dips across the state, we still performed as well as, or in some cases, quite a bit better. When you're looking at English language arts, um, grade seven did quite a bit better than the state, grade six did quite a bit better than the state, and grade 10 did quite a bit, bit better than the state. Um, again, in the next uh, bit of data is for mathematics. Also, you can see in 2022 that um, there were several grades where Hadley Public Schools outperformed the state. In some cases by a long shot, I really want to, and I'm anticipating there'll be an article in the Gazette. They did come and take a picture and talk with Ms. Parker and Mr. Siaglo. You'll notice in grade five, in 2022, 70% of fifth graders are meeting or exceeding expectations in mathematics as opposed to 36% statewide. In sixth grade, 72% of the students are, were meeting or exceeding in the spring as, as opposed to 42% statewide. Um, and grade 10 also outperformed the state where in the state 50% are meeting or exceeding and 64% in grade 10 in Hadley Public Schools. In science, uh, our science teachers, so, uh, Ms. Parker, our middle school science team, Ms. Duncan, um, our high school science team, they really hit the ball out of the park. You can see that 60% uh, of our fifth graders meeting or exceeding in science, 54% of our eighth graders, this again, it's higher than uh, the state and 72% um, in grade 10 as opposed to 47% in the state. And last year was a tough year, as was the year before. So these, um, these are impressive. On the student growth percentile, um, all of our teachers, I really wanna underscore this, and our students are, are hardworking superstars. But I do have to call out again, grade five and six, because not only did they have incredibly high achievement, they also had incredibly high growth, right? So their high growth, high achievement in mathematics in grades five and six. Uh, in grade seven, we see high growth uh, in ELA and in grade 10 in English language arts. Um, and uh, in terms of one thing that made me very uh, happy when we compare our median composite scores, um, now we do see a slight dip from 2019 pre-pandemic to 2022. Um, this English language arts grade three through eight, when you look at all students, you see you see a slight dip, but, and again, 2019 pre-pandemic, 2022, those were long and challenging period when we were in school, but in each category, English language arts three through eight, mathematics three through eight, science three through eight, um, in each of those categories, students that, that qualify in the high needs category, that group in, improved from 19 to 22. That made my heart sing. So that, that's fantastic. Um, and then finally, our accountability percentiles. So this is a percentile number. 
where schools with like configurations, you're putting your percentile ranking. We see that we saw improvement from 21 to 22 at HES and significant improvement at Hopkins Academy going from 66th percentile in 2021 to the 83rd percentile in 2022. Um, so that is our update on MCAS. And um, I look forward to, and, and also for us, even more important than MCAS is that regular screening that we do. So teachers are already in the fall. And the good news is that some of the students that look like they struggled on MCAS in the spring, their fall screening data shows them on track to do well, to meet grade level benchmarks, or in the case of our MAP testing, it actually predicts how they'll perform on the MCAS in the spring. So our fall screening scores in many cases were, gave us better news than, uh, than our spring MCAS data, which is not surprising because MCAS is stressful, it's unique, it's a one-off. The screening data is really a much more useful tool for us. We use MCAS to ask questions about the extent to which our curriculum is aligned. We don't use it to evaluate educator practice because it's a single moment in time or over a couple of days, whereas our screening data um, helps us get a much better understanding of where kids are at and what they need. And we do that three times a year. And that's it for MCAS until next spring. Thank you, Annie. I was very heartened to see uh, the uh, results. Um, I had a, a Hopkins Academy uh, teenager who came home very happy to show me some scores. And uh, I have to say, you know, we're, we're a district that prides ourselves on not teaching to the test. Mm -hmm. And we um, experience, you know, see great results um, by diversifying our, the ways in which we teach. Um, and um, very, very proud of all the teachers and students uh, with these results. Um, comments from Paul, Ethan, Christine? So the 2019, that's this year's seniors, correct? Oh my gosh. You got yes, there. Right. Thank you. Uh, 2019, this year's seniors? Yes, because right. they would have taken MCAS that 10th grade. Correct. So they'd currently be seniors. We did that right? I'm going to blame you if we didn't. We did that right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, right. 19 spring, 2021. 20, so it wouldn't be this year's seniors. They no, graduated no. last year. Oh, okay. 11, 12. Yeah. They graduated last year. Correct. 2019, spring of 2019, it would have graduated. Any two, two questions? One is um, what's accountability? Per, per what's the accountability percentile? Yeah. So it's when the state looks at, again, true percentile ranking, which you could do a better if people were interested in a um, explanation of percentile rankings, but they take your configuration. So we, Hopkins is compared to 712 like configurations and what they analyze there are scaled scores, growth, all the aspects of MCAS. So how your students performed compared to how, and these are aggregate and composite scores. So they, they look at uh, aggregate student uh, growth percentile. They look at uh, median composite score, um, percentage of students meeting and exceeding expectations. And then they kind of rank you against similarly configured schools. So had the elementary is compared with all K-6 schools throughout the state, Hopkins Academy is compared to all 712 schools. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah that's it, okay, thanks. And then that second to last slide showing the changes and rankings over the 2019 to 22. So given the, the, what's been in the news lately about significant decline in student scores due to COVID, I take this to mean that our students are essentially haven't shown that same decline or even have shown an increase. Am I In some you? cases where you would look, and again, what's tricky about MCAS, right, is that you're comparing unlike cohorts. So that's why we say we focus on curriculum. But if you, if you look at, for example, the English language arts, uh, that first slide after the title slide, you see in 2021, you, you're comparing our columns is what we want to do. So, so we have seen some variance. And even when we're outperforming the state, we did see, you know, we're not performing as well as we did in 2021. Now also, and that, that I have to tell you was a little bit surprising for me because I thought 
goodness gracious, 2021 was a year that we came back, we were in person. Um, but I thought, gosh, that seemed more complicated. However, when I reflect on last year, there was a tremendous amount of absenteeism for good reason. What I have not done is analyzed the correlation between absenteeism and performance and legitimate reasons for absenteeism. But um, there was, and we also had periods of, you know, outbreaks of a lot of illness. Um, so I think, so overall compared to the state, I'm pleased, but you can also compare our year to year and say, oh yeah, there's certainly a COVID effect there, no doubt. Um, we just, perhaps we can say, we didn't feel your point. We didn't experience the same, perhaps as severe of an effect as some other districts. Yeah. Any other questions for Annie? Okay, right. terrific. Annie, thank you. And this does not, this is just a presentation, doesn't require a vote. We're gonna move on to second reading of district wellness policy. Annie? Yes, so this you saw last time, first reading, Ethan and Christine had spoken about it uh, and Ms. Dowd presented at policy subcommittee. So you had a chance to review it last time and now um, as, the, as the regular school committee does, you get one first reading and you vote on it at your second reading. Terrific, does anyone have any uh, thoughts or comments about the uh, wellness program and policy as proposed. I thought it was a very well written and comprehensive document that spanned multiple areas of a student's uh, life. And uh, I'm just really happy to see it coming together. And I would like to point out, you'll wanna thank your district well wellness coordinator, Jennifer Downs for that, because uh, I no longer am in charge, which is a good thing. I had uh, a Kit Kat and a V8 for lunch today. So I'm no longer in charge of the wellness committee and this is all missed out. Thanks, Jen. Yes, thank you. I, I was on this committee a long time ago and, uh, and I'm just really glad to see this uh, great group that you're working with. And uh, um, it's a, it looks like a pretty uh, excellent plan. So do I hear a motion to approve this uh, wellness policy? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move to the superintendent report on records review for Hartsbrook. Yes. Annie. So upon a closer reading of your policy, I've had you voting annually for to allow Hartsbrook to operate. And Paul, you understandably asked a question every year. I don't understand why we put on this. You do have to, according to your policy, if a private school starts in the community, if they wanna start a private school, you would have to vote on that. But the policy is that I have to review all the records every single year that's in our L policies. So I go through the checklist to make sure they have a certificate of occupancy. I review their financials. I have to do this every year. They send me all the paperwork. I go through, I go through the checklist that's in our policy and in the school committee policies. And I'm here to report to you this evening that they've met all of the criteria for continued operation. So um, Hartsbrook will continue to operate in the district. There'd be no reason for them not to. They've met all the criteria but it does not require your vote. Okay, terrific, thank you. So just so, on that, Annie, so in the future, that's it, only when one- Only when committee? one wants to start, correct. Okay. So the policy, if somebody wants to start a private school, the school committee has to approve it initially. And then the policy every year, I have to, the superintendent has to evaluate all of their documents to make sure they've met the criteria and the checklist is included in the policies in section L of our policies, community relations. So do you sign something and affirm something to the state? I affirm something to Hartsbrook and they then I think have to keep it with their documents. Right. I don't, the state doesn't ask it. They don't ask anything from me, no. How much time does this take from you? I'm just curious. 
Um, not much time at all because Hartsbrook is excellent at putting together their records. I give them a copy of the criteria in the checklist. They know exactly what to give me. They have it all in order. Then I just go through and check it. And we make site visits over there because we also, uh, part of federal grants having to do with IDEA, Celia and I, and more so Celia, are routinely over there um, having site visits because we will have meetings over there. Thanks. Sure. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, item I, parent donation of lawn signs. Annie? Yes, very simply, we have some parents who wish to remain anonymous. They would like to donate uh, lawn signs. I've seen images of them. They say things like school zone and slow down. I believe they'll also potentially be going to the select board to see if they might be able to put them in front of uh, some of the municipal buildings along uh, Route 9. I'm also going to ask the parents if they would be comfortable with putting some in front of Hadley Elementary School. Route 47, people can travel at a pretty good clip and not realize that when they're headed over to UMass. Because this is a donation, one, I'd like to acknowledge the parents. It's very kind of them to donate uh, something to the school department and potentially the town to try to bring awareness to student safety and school safety. But any donation needs to be accepted by the school committee. I, quick question, why are they not school zones? Why, so there why? are school zones. They just want to also just draw attention to, um, so we have a flashing light right before had the elementary school. Um, so we do have, yeah. And this is, these are just additional designs to, that would go like in front of Russell School. They may be asking alongside Town Hall where there's grass, like I said, maybe along any, any place where there's a, one of our buildings, a public building along Route 9. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we vote on this? I think it's great because I, I honestly, I just don't feel like it is very well marked. People just seem to fly up and down Route 9. Um, you know, obviously there's the stop sign, the, the stop light. And I think people are always trying to get to the stop light before it turns yellow. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's as clearly marked as I thought it used to. Be. I don't know why I... I'm paying attention now, I guess, a little bit more than I have in the past, obviously, because it's, you know, something that um, has been brought to my attention to really look at it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's great that people want to, to donate them. Great. Yes, many thanks to the parents who are organizing the lawn signs. Uh, I think it'll be um, a great asset. Joyce. Um, yeah, Joyce has a comment. Joyce, you can uh, unmute yourself if you, I welcome you to say something. Okay, um, yes, I just want to just chime in on this one factor that uh, we have been in conversation with uh, the state on very numerous occasions about marking off where the school zone is on Route 9. So it's not something that we have um, slid by or not addressed. Uh, and, and I just wanna say that we will continue to, uh, while they're doing their construction to still be on top of them to see what we can do about making it more uh, of an awareness. And I also wanna thank the parents and I would also when they bring it before the select board to support this for them. Excellent, thank you, Joyce. Okay, um, so let's um, put to, to forth a motion. Anything? We have not. I'm I'm interested in a motion. <laughs> Would anyone like to propose one? Sure. Uh, yes, I support a motion to accept the signs. Thank you, Paul. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Okay, we're moving on to business manager reports. Chris, are you there? I am here, there. Um, okay, so you have two reports in your packages tonight. Uh, the first is the regular expense report that I send to everyone um, every month. Not much really, you know, it's early in the school year. There's not a lot to report. I did wanna point out a couple of items that uh, 
might have gotten your attention. Uh, the first one is on page six of eight pages. It's the tuition to non-public schools. Um, that's a SPED tuition line, and it shows that we're $171,000 over budget. Um, in reality, we did the transfers of those purchase orders after this report was run, moving one of the purchase orders to Circuit Breaker and the other to the 240 grant. So we're actually under budget um, as we speak today. When I ran the report, it was still showing in the original account. So um, that's nothing to worry about there. And I believe there was another line too that had a similar uh, little adventure to it. Um, no, actually that was the only one. Um, my apologies. So, um, you know, looking in good shape, obviously, um, no, nothing to worry about. Um, we are getting the grants coming in now. The grants are a little behind this year. I think they've been a little slower the past few years just because of the sheer number of grants that have come out. I know the grant department at DESE is just going straight out every time I speak with them there. Just uh, <laughs> kind of saying how, how just straight out busy they are. And so they're not getting approved quite as quickly as normal. Um, but by next month, we should have all of the usual grants and some of the new ones that Anne had discussed earlier on a report for you. As, as of right now, we don't really have anything to report for the grants. Um, but once we do, those expenses will be moving over. We'll, we'll have other expenses that will move over to the grants as well. It'll free up even more money in the regular budget. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about the, the general budget report that I give. No questions for me. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. And then the other report we have is the revolving class report. Um, everything looks in good shape with these. Um, we had some expenses at the athletic revolving for hockey ice time. Um, that was actually quite expensive and brought the balance down considerably from where we were in August, um, lunch account hasn't had a deposit yet. So you can see basically since June, it's come down about $30,000, but we've yet to have deposit posted to that account on the town side. So once we do that, um, the balance will come back up again. Uh, preschool revolving is actually a little bit higher right now than it was at the beginning of the year, which is certainly nice to see. Um, student activity is going to take a big decrease. There's a Washington DC trip coming up and uh, there's a big check going out. So you'll see that balance drop considerably. Um, if not, I, I think it should drop by the, by the um, October 31st report. Um, Hadley kids again, going up a little bit from the beginning of the year and school choice. We haven't had any expenses charged to that yet. So you can see it's got a high balance right now, but that will come down um, both with the budgeted expenses that we've had and also just from the uh, facilities report that Colliers did over the summer or late last year. Um, and we're doing some of the improvements uh, with school choice funds for that as well. So um, that balance will obviously come down over the course of the year. Any questions on the revolvings? So the ice time, I know we co-op hockey with uh, Amherst, right? Do we, do we compensate some of the ice time fees? Yeah, it's actually um, almost $5,000. It's, it's pretty expensive. Um, if I remember correctly, I'm just going off of memory. I think it was about $800 a kid. Um, so it was, it was quite a bit. Okay, it's expensive, but I know our, our kids have really valued playing it over there. So absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions for Chris? Great, thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move to school committee reports and discussions. I'll start with finance. There has not been a tri board meeting on uh, finance, so I have nothing to report on that yet. Um, I will uh, say for CES, Tara could not be here. She sends regrets and she will give her report out next month. Uh, policy, Ethan. Good evening. Um, uh, we met uh, earlier today, Christine and I, along with Annie and Sergeant Romero, and had the first conversation around the proposed MOU with the police. Um, and and we, I believe Annie will have that conversation on next month's agenda for the first reading. Okay, very good. And uh, 
Next, we have Fields. Yeah, thanks, Yamara. I, I will say it's um, it's quite an exciting time, actually. So on uh, the 27th of this week, so on Thursday, there'll be the Fall Town meeting. And on that, there's a warrant for uh, that recommendation from the CPA, the Community Preservation, Preservation Act Group, to award uh, Hopkins uh, $1.5 million for the second phase of the athletic fields. So this is over a decade in coming, right? And so years ago, we went through these uh, efforts to raise funds. I uh, had a lot of amazing donors uh, from the town, from the CPA funds, from the Hopkins uh, trustees, from multiple uh, businesses and individuals around the, the town to do uh, the first phase of what we always knew was a multi-phase project. So we went out there and engaged the landowners, the public about the design. And we, a year or so ago, we finished that project, right? Now, so now we have a brand new softball field, a brand new uh, baseball field, multi-use field, all on land that had been facilitated and purchased by the trustees and, and provided to the school years and years ago. So it was really the culmination of a long dream so now we find ourselves uh, ready to do that second phase. Um, and so what we have proposed to do uh, was redo the varsity boys baseball field, which is in dire need of renovation to uh, do some more uh, field work and, and create another multi-use field and then redo a girls softball field. And then in addition, uh, complete something we had started last time, which was a, a paved path around the field that I know gets a lot of community use, uh, that is going to now be fully completed into a, fu a full loop. So really looking forward to seeing that come to town meeting on Thursday. I want to say thank you to CPA for, uh, for their vast support of this. It, it's a large project. Uh, make no mistake. It's, it's expensive, as most things are these days. There's a lot of grading, a lot of irrigation, uh, expenses, uh, supplies have gone up in cost. And so we really appreciate CPA support. I guess I would just say, let's look at this as um, not just the culmination of all those folks' hard work, but really just an investment in the school, right? I think as we heard earlier, we pride ourselves in, in having uh, excellent academics. I think also we pride ourselves in having excellent athletics, right? We are a school that those small uh, really excel and, and we excel in a lot of different ways. So I think we, this field just helps continue that tradition of excellence in athletics for Hopkins. Um, that frankly, this is a, a big expenditure that'll last decades and benefit uh, multiple generations. So I encourage everybody to get out, come out on Thursday uh, to that town meeting. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, sorry, Paul. Um, question. Uh, and a question that I've heard from others, um, how will this impact taxes uh, from towns folks? I, I encourage folks to look at what's what, how the Community Preservation Act Fund works. It was something that the town had previously, it's a state law that towns can voluntarily opt into. They have to have a, I think it's a two third majority vote at the town meeting. So years ago, had they decided to do that. So there's a portion of our tax, uh, property taxes that go into this fund. There's an elected body, the Community Preservation Act, that gets to adjudicate recommendations on how to spend those funds. Uh, and it has to be approved at town meeting. So they have, uh, we met with them several times. They were wonderful, asked, you know, frankly, hard questions, very thoughtful questions. And in the end, they decided to, to recommend that the project gets approved. So now it's up to the town. Uh, from what I understand, right, is this, this project alone does not change the allocation, the percentage of our property taxes that will go into the Community Preservation Act. Great, thank you. Um, this is an exciting uh, phase. And, uh, you know, I, I've been on the school committee for a dozen years. And I remember our, uh, you know, many moons ago, the composition looked totally different. Um, my four other colleagues on the committee were totally different. And we really, uh, it took quite a while to get us to this point. And uh, we're, I'm really grateful to you, Paul, for bringing us uh, you know, project managing and, and fundraising and really pulling together all the pieces. 
Um, and I'm really excited to see phase two to completion. Um, and uh, um, one thing you mentioned was the trustees involvement. In fact, the trustees purchased the land for us and then gifted it to the town for, uh, to, for our use. Um, and that is, you know, the fact that uh, this, is, this is really, that's really to me a signal that the community through the Hopkins trustees uh, really wanted uh, this upgrade. And I think it's really important for us to um, help make this happen and bring it over the finish line. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, Any other thoughts? Well, yeah. just, to, just to pick up on that, thank, thank you for the shout out. I will say it's many hands, right? Chris, Annie, um, the, the trustees, as you mentioned, have been not only helped uh, purchase and, and donate the land, then, but they were very influential and making sure the first phase was completed, East Hampton Savings Bank, multiple, multiple individuals provided donations. So it's, uh, it's really been a community effort. Thank you to all. And yes. so a quick question. So um, the loop will be completed in this phase? The, That's right. That's right. The, this, yeah. So the community can all use that, the track for walking and et cetera, correct? Exactly. So right. It benefits it's, the community as well. It definitely does. Yeah. And if you go out, I mean, as you've seen, Christine, that, that it, what's out there now gets lots of use. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I understand there's great. also an, um, a component of the uh, safety, the design of the walkway and the path contributes to safety. I think, Annie, you might have been mentioning that to me. Can you say a word about that? Honestly, Paul would say it better, but it does allow access for emergency response vehicles. And I'm sure we will also be looking at ways that we can create access for people with mobility issues who need to get to that side of the track, which is really challenging right now if you have mobility issues. Great, thank you. Okay, um, no action required. We will, uh, but we urge um, all our team members to attend town meeting this Thursday, 7 p.m. at Hopkins Academy. Uh, I urge parents and community members to come out to Hopkins Academy for that meeting and uh, to, to help support the fields project. Uh, and thank you for that. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to capital, Christine, and negotiations, by the way, so you, we get a double header from you. Right. Well, the negotiations uh, we will talk about in an executive session. Um, and then the capital, um, we have two things on there. One is the upgrade to the safety, um, the fire safety, the fire apparatus. And the second is the ceiling tiles, which uh, both are going to be uh, presented at town meeting. So um, both are safety issues. They're not, it's not something that is um, on our want list, it's on our need list. So, um, you know, we not something we could have prepared for, but something that has to be done. Great, thank you, Christine. All right, and, uh, and that too is up for town meeting approval. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good, thank you. So another reason to come out, um, supporters of the schools. Okay, um, we're gonna move next to announcements. Um, we have Joyce Chunglo here with us. Joyce, welcome. Any announcements on behalf of the select board? I don't have anything. I was just gonna say, please come out for a town meeting. Um, I've always been a strong supporter of the school system. I think listening tonight, you have many initiatives and things that you have done that are great, just even for the start of the year, but also what has happened in, with your MCAS and things like that. So again, I am very proud, even though it's been a long time, I won't say how many that I was on school committee, but um, school committee has always been on the top of my list. They're, the, the students are our future. So there are many things that I appreciate. So come out for town meeting. Um, this is everybody's town. Everything that we do is for everybody. And again, we need to all come out, support the school, support 
um, the highway department, which plows our yards and does all of those things for us. So, you know, that, that was the main crux of, uh, of tonight. Um, me being a nurse and still in the field, I'm, I'm out there saying that there is an uptake of COVID. Uh, so us to be diligent about how we uh, prepare ourselves and do things and make sure that if you have any signs or symptoms, please uh, be aware of getting checked and not just going to school thinking that you're okay. Just uh, uh, be aware of everybody that you come in contact with too. So um, I'm, I'm one of those supporters, but uh, great job, everybody. Uh, really enjoyed your meeting tonight and, and uh, thank you for doing what you do. I appreciate it all. And we whole town does, but you need to hear that because I don't think everybody gets out there and says that to you. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks. Very kind. Thank you. Thanks. I just right. want to quickly remind people yeah. on the calendar, if I may, Humira, this week, Please. parent conferences, Hadley Elementary School. That means Hadley Elementary School has a half day, 26, 27, 28. Hadley Elementary School, 26, 27, 28. All three days, uh, early dismissal. At Hopkins Academy, Half day Friday only, because they have only one night of uh, parent teacher conferences. And those parent teacher conferences uh, are occurring on the evening of the 27th. But people can, if you have a parent teacher's conference scheduled, do your conference, go over to town meeting. You don't have to be there right at the start, or you can come in at any time and sign in. So um, just wanted to make sure people are aware of the calendar and the half days this week. Great. Thank you. And do any of my school committee colleagues have any announcements to make? Okay, um, I have one, which is that uh, Hadley Learns is having an event on November 3rd called Housing for Hadley. And we have two special guest speakers, including Rosa Tobin of the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center and um, Alexis Britschneischer of the Valley CDC. We'll also be talking about the um, Hadley Housing Survey. Uh, and the results of that, um, there's a YouTube link on the Hadley Learns uh, event page. So just go to hadleylearns.com and you'll see uh, a number of resources in the events section that you can read up on or listen to before this November 3rd event on Zoom at 7 p.m. Eastern. There's an RSVP link. If you complete that, you get the Zoom link. Um, so um, take a look at that. All right, um, we have some additional items to pass. We have an approval of minutes. Joyce, I think you married us. Yeah. Joyce, you wanna say something? Just a quick thing, a fun thing for our kids. There is trunk or treat uh, happening mm -hmm. Friday night. Uh, so just want people to be aware. And there's been just a little change in the uh, venue that you can park at the uh, Hadley Elementary School and they have uh, uh, on their, uh, website they have put out how you can come over to the police station for kids to wear their costumes and actually be able to walk from trunk to trunk and actually instead of driving through so if uh, people want to do that that's a little bit different this year too so just to let people out to know that so always good to have fun things too yeah i, I actually was going to mention that because um i'll actually be there in costume Yay. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Joyce. Are you going to give it away, Christine? Do we have to guess? Uh, oh. It's definitely going to be a pun. I tend oh. to like my pun cost costumes. All right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Very funny. Okay. Um, now we're gonna move on to the remaining action items. We have the approval of minutes, September 12th, 2022. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific. We have the approval of executive session minutes for August 22, 2022. I make a motion. Second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. We have the approval of the warrants for September 2022. And um, is this the one where we no longer have an abstention on this, do we? That's correct. Everybody can. Okay. Okay. okay, terrific. So do I hear a motion to approve the warrants? 
Chair, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. Uh, we've already approved the district wellness policy. Mm -hmm. We've already approved the district strategy and the 22-23 priorities. Um, our next meeting date is November 28th at 5.30 for the regular school committee meeting and 4.30 for the policy subcommittee. Um, we are moving into executive session and we will uh, all leave this uh, room, convene in a breakout room, um, and then we will return back. So I'm gonna move here, move to go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and to reconvene in open session. So I will go ahead and make that breakout room and we I will have to do a roll call to it. You have to- That's right. Call it that. um, uh, Pfeiffer. Yes, sorry. That's all right, Percy. <laughs> yes. Pipchinski. Yes. And Fasidin, yes. Terrific, we um, are returning from executive session and are voting on the bus contract. Um, we need a roll call vote. Um, and I'm sorry, the motion is to approve the settlement agreement, correct? Yes. That is correct. Um, do I hear a, a motion for to approve the settlement? So moved. Seconded. Okay, and now we need a roll call vote. We'll start with Percy. Yes. Dipchinski. Yes. Pfeiffer. Yes. Fasidin, yes. Motion passes. All right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you again next month. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Yeah, motion to adjourn. Yes, Paul. Oh, there's yes. that. We should do that. Yeah. Motion yes. To adjourn. Do I hear yes, a second? Yes. Seconded. Thanks, All everybody. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.